All right, everybody, welcome to this week's live stream on introduction to Hay. Um, so I wanted to remind everyone to like and subscribe to our channel if you haven't yet. Um, if you're someone that watches every week, I'm sure you've already done so. But if you're new or re-watching this video um, after the live stream, please go ahead and do that. Um, so this is introduction to Hay. We have about two weeks left, and I know that this is a pretty special topic to Jeff. I think that he always enjoys talking about hay. Um, I know that it's something that's fun to do as well. Um, I kind of like it. I know some people are always like, oh, I can't, you know, don't want to do it. It's always hot um, kind of thing, but this is pretty cool. So before we get started, I wanted to ask you, Jeff, can you think about like the first time that you got to, you know, bale hay with the crew? What was that like? Oh, wow. Well, it's just about four years ago. It was in Arkansas. It was very hot day and uh, um, it was and it was it was a large I mean it was a 300 acre farm I think that day we had uh, oh I don't know 60 70 acres down and it was like we're gonna get this all up today yeah. really <laughs> <laughs> we had a nice huge historical barn to put it in but it was it was just the uh, let's get her done and uh, the teamwork um, the, uh, the, the strategy of uh, putting up hay is a very, um, it's, it's like it's, it's for a group that's done a lot, you know, it's, it's a well-oiled machine. Mm -hmm. So for it's, sure. it's fun to watch them get by. Yeah. I remember my first time, um, I was like 10 or 12, something like that. Um, it wasn't baling hay, but it was just like stacking bales, you know, in a barn. Mm -hmm. And I remember just like being on top of the trailer throwing just like, you know, 200 bales down to my dad, you know, it was like yeah. insane. But, you know, you feel so proud when you're done. And I know like my first time bailing hay at Stratford, um, it's just so fun to kind of work with that team. You know, it's kind of like playing a sport a little bit. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. So Thank I really you. like it. And I, you know, continue to like, I keep bringing friends out to try it too. And it seems like they like it. So um, yeah. we're excited to kind of share this with you today. Um, before we get started, I'm going to jump to the schedule and then we will show you kind of like a rundown of you know, what you need to plant, you know, kind of the whole transition of, you know, baling hay, planting, and then putting it up in the barn. So I'll go ahead and do that. Okay, hey, I'm Jeff Dickinson and welcome to our continuing series uh, for our Beginning Farmers Collaborative and Regenerative uh, Agriculture series. And uh, today the topic is haying. And this is not the best kind of day to be haying or even talking about it. Actually for photography it's, uh, it's good lighting so we'll take advantage of it. So we thought we'd take you through all the steps and things that I sort of pay attention to when we produce hay. We are a grass-based farm, so it's a very important component. So um, this was an attempt early on in the season, again, the weather's been sort of wreaking havoc with us, to start a hay field. Uh, this was corn last year. I had actually originally uh, planted it uh, in rye and a different mix. Uh, but then immediately after I planted it this spring, we got a six inch rain uh, that washed a lot of it out and it actually uh, sort of 
exposes what I call the, the seed bank that's in the soil at all times and it germinated other things. So I basically started over. Um, also realized that the rye I had wasn't the best rye. It was left over from last year. Uh, it actually got infected uh, with insects over the winter. So seed storage obviously is very important. So the second attempt, we went, since we're later in the season, what we call a triticow, which is a cross between uh, rye and wheat. And uh, it's pretty durable later in the season, and actually it's good for uh, a late season, pre-winter um, addition. So, um, but anyways, it's pretty much the same thing happened. We prepared the soil, and that night, the night I planted it, we got a two-inch rain. Um, now, the, it did, we did get good germination. I thought things were good. Um, the triticale was going to serve as a nursing crop, but we, um, I was going to do some buckwheat and sunflower on top to enhance the nursing because we were getting into the heat of the summer. And, uh, and plus, we, we raise bees here, as you know. And so uh, what's happened uh, since or before I could get the sunflower and buckwheat into this field, again, weather, uh, the pigweed. Uh, you see all this broadleaf stuff that's coming up everywhere and this has become a pigweed field and pigweed is one of the more uh, aggressive competitors for grass crop and legume crops It even would suppress um, the nurse crop which is the triticale and it'd be impossible for sunflower and, um, and buckwheat to do well in this situation. So I'm actually looking at redoing this field again but um, it's, it's not all lost. You can see some of the grass is starting to come through. Um, I'll probably let it grow up before I plow it back down and go for a fall planting on this field. And, uh, and the idea is to create a mix. In this mix, I have two types of clover, uh, a red and a white. And I've got two types of grass. And actually, the triticale itself will become a good first cutting addition to that crop. So let's check out some other fields. Okay, so this is a uh, actually in the same era, the first field that I showed you that we attempted to plant and replanted. Um, this is actually still from the first trial. Um, and actually things, this, this field was a combination, again, the whole idea is to plant for hay making, um, is to uh, do a combination of uh, sedan sorghum uh, which is a great uh, combination for doing a late season cutting or actually for direct grazing even. Um, it actually stores uh, very well over winter and feeds out well. But um, again, I used last year's seed. Um, and this was a combination of uh, sedan sorghum and uh, buckwheat and some festuloleum that I had left over. And we've talked about festuloleum and my, my livestock actually love that as a, as a grass crop. So anyways, it started off better than the first field we looked at. Uh, but the sedan sorghum, it became very obvious that part of that seed was infected too. We had a very mild winter, wet winter. So in seed storage, you get a lot of seed in, or insect infestation in that seed. So it's very scattered. Um, you can tell it's been here so long uh, that um, there's actually milkweed coming in it and there's a sunflower from a couple years ago. Um, there's a variety of things in here. The festuloleum alone is worth keeping uh, at this stage uh, to go ahead and harvest it late summer uh, with the sedan sorghum in it um, and hopefully it will be through the monarch butterfly um, uh, hatching that's probably happening on that milkweed back there. So. Um, you keep trying, that's farming. You know, you get what you can and you just keep moving forward. So let's see a little more mature pasture. Okay, we're moving down the series of uh, fields that are now ready to be cut. Uh, sad news about this field, it's like three weeks past being ready to be cut. Um, this is an older pasture. Um, actually, it's probably uh, I think this is its third year uh, in its rotation. 
Uh, it's actually ready to be uh, converted in the next rotational move um, this fall, probably to spelt, or I could possibly hold it back to corn next year, uh, again, depending on the season. So this field was originally a spelt field three years ago. Uh, the spelt was taken uh, as grain, and we, uh, when I plant the spelt, there's a timothy and clover mix within it. Um, because of the winter we had, uh, it was a very wet year again, the winter, um, the clover became dominant over the timothy, and so the clover dominates this field. Uh, because of it being in the third year, you start to get the other perennial grasses that are coming in, um, and, and perennial plants, uh, and some legumes. Uh, so what you're seeing in front of you is Queen Anne's Lace, which can be very dominant in a, a long-term rotation. And then this has been the year of chicory. I've, I love the plant. We mentioned it before. It's actually a great forage for animals. They love it. Uh, they're not big on the Queen Anne's lace, but they like the chicory. And, um, and so what you see underneath here, all these dark heads, it's a medium red clover. Um, and it's, uh, when you cut hay from a predominantly clover field, you're, you're typically wanting to cut when you got the field totally in bloom and you only have maybe 10% of the um, these continue to produce clover flowers until it becomes all like this. And um, so you're thinking about 10, 15, maybe up to 20% of this could be turned already from the medium red color that it, that it has. And, uh, and, and that could be a clue as to when to cut. When you have your grasses in, that's actually a better clue as to when to cut. Um, in orchard grass, for instance, I like to be in the, what they call the boot stage, when the plant is actually just getting ready uh, to push the seed head out. Um, in a uh, timothy, um, it's very similar. Um, it's not a true boot like, uh, like orchard grass, but you can see uh, the axles will actually start to push uh, a seed head, and, uh, and that's when you're thinking about cutting it. Now in today's world, uh, where it's difficult to cut hay and get it up and dry uh, in three days, um, I don't sort of use those cues as much. I'll take any window I can get in today's world to cut hay. And, uh, and this, these fields, I've been wanting to cut these for the last, like I said, three weeks. Actually, three weeks ago, I was actually debating keeping this field for grazing because we were starting to get into the dearth of the summer and uh, the heat and the dry. And as soon as I cut a field like this, that is within our pasture grazing system, that's when we hit the drought. And then all of a sudden here I am in the middle of summer with no pasture. So I was hedging the bet and then things continue to happen in the pasture areas. So I said, okay, it's hay, but mother nature says, no, we're gonna rain. So that's where we're at. So, we're going to look at the pastures. This is a good place to see the system while we're here. Um, we're going to do a spin around, and the field immediately across from me right now is one of the first fields I grazed uh, this spring. Uh, the animals grazed it well. I actually came in after they finished what they're going to eat and clipped it. I'm primarily clipping the grasses, a little bit of the clover, but the grasses, once they go to seed head, they pretty much stop growing until you remove that seed head. It's the same with the legumes too. They slow down. So I always, I'm a big clipper of pastures. Livestock just don't clean it up like they should. And um, the only time you'll see them graze everything to nothing is late season, or if you try to do like a, a early winter type grazing, they'll take everything down right to the nubbins because they know they're going into winter and they're not going to have anything else to eat uh, other than the dry hay I'm throwing at them in the barn. So this field right here, it's a five acre field, it's divided into three paddocks. So that paddock's been resting for 
uh, about five weeks now, six weeks coming up. I try to get about 42, 45 days in between paddocks. So the middle paddock is the paddock they're still in, but I've already clipped it actually because what they did is they took all the good stuff, the gravy and the cream. And, uh, and they, again, we had a lot of seed heads and I wanted to encourage new growth while we were still getting rain. So I clipped it high, when I, I, what I call a high clip, and that's for me is about eight inches. And uh, I leave a lot of the clover alone. And uh, again, getting those seed heads off the grass to encourage new growth from that. So if you go under the third paddock, uh, where the livestock are now, and I actually have both of them open for them, but you can see their preference is that green field. Now, if we were up close, I could show you that majority of that green field is actually ragweed. And ragweed is, a net, again, a consequence of a season with a lot of rain and a lot of heat and humidity. In fact, ragweed seed doesn't germinate well until it goes through the gut of an earthworm. So um, it's a good indicator that we got plenty of earthworms in our soils. Um, and people who sort of talk about the loss of nutrients through the soil, they blame the earthworms um, because they do create a large tunnel ch uh, system, channeling system through the soil, and water does move freely through that. But for the most part, from my perspective, that's a good thing. So what they're doing actually is grazing a lot of short, young, common ragweed. It's not the giant ragweed, which is very palatable to livestock at a young age. But what's underneath that is a hay crop that's coming along very well. That field was corn. Um, last fall, I did a second planting into that field because, again, my normal entry is, is oats. That failed, again, due to weather. I replanted that in the fall in rye with a, um, uh, an orchard alfalfa uh, crop. Actually, it was a four-way mix. There's some Timothy and red, medium red, too. And uh, that germinated well. The rye actually grew. That was one of the better fields we had. So we actually cut that rye in the, in the milk or dough stage uh, between milk and dough is ideal scenario. Again, weather's driving everything. We made that hay and made good hay and the new pasture and the new potential hay crop was growing underneath. Things are working well in this field and like they are here, but uh, again, Mother Nature rules all. So uh, let's start the process about how we start taking the hay down um, and head to the equipment shed and the barn. Okay, so we're gonna start thinking about the process of making hay. And behind me is a hay bind. We visited this piece of equipment earlier in our series. Um, this was a donation. And uh, so typically on a hay cutting day, um, ideally you want a good drying day. And ideally you're gonna wait for the morning dew to come off the grass so that when you cut it and lay it down, you're not immediately creating moisture between the, what becomes the piled grass. And um, so, um, so you want things to dry off a little bit and obviously you need at least a three day window and three days in today's world is really pushing it. Um, ideally four. And, uh, and the beauty of this piece of equipment behind me is it helps take that fourth day out of the equation. Um, this is a hay bind. It's a combination sickle bar that most people are familiar with seeing where it was just a, a drop down sickle bar and you cut hay and you go on to the next field. Uh, this has a sickle bar like that, but this also is um, um, actually gets the, the grass upright. So it gives you a clean cut. That's what this rake is for on the front. So it's like standing the grass up, it's cutting it gives you a clean cut which enhances new growth and actually reduces potential for disease from frayed cut edges. And then it's shot right through these two black rollers behind it which are, which are corrugated and sort of nestled together a little bit. And it shoots the hay through and crimps it. And it's that act of crimping it that actually dries the hay quicker. And, uh, and there's a couple other things in the back here. Um, there's a like a baffle that I can either raise or lower in the back as it shoots out of the, the crimper, out of the rollers. And I like to generally keep it 
down because what that does is the hay comes out pretty much in the same direction and the baffle actually stops and blocks that and starts to create piles that are more multi-directional and actually fluffs the hay up on the ground and it actually helps the drying if you can get air into the into the hay and then in the very back there's a it's like a chute that you can open and narrow and um, it, uh, it basically you can decide the width of the initial windrow you're creating by cutting hay now I'm, I'm, I'm a big windrow guy now, if you were the type of um, person that likes to tet your hay, tattering, um, or some people call it tetting, but tattering is what I've been known uh, to hear. And um, it, it's the idea that you let it set a day. Some people actually go in the same day if you do it early and wait towards the end of the day and re-fluff the hay. And, sh and my problem with tattering in, in general is, is, um, is that it, it has a tendency, if you're sort of late in the life cycle of the plant, it shatters the flower and the seed head, uh, and, and, and also it can sort of tear apart uh, things like alfalfa. It'll actually strip the leaves off the alfalfa if you're not careful about how much and how often you do that. I keep the process as simple, and I'm not really touching that hay once I get it on the ground until no sooner than the day before, ideally the day of making hay. And um, so it's, there's a variety of ways to approach this. I, 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 you could talk to 20 farmers who make hay and you'll get 20 different ways to make it. So, and so everybody, and it, it, it relates to the equipment, it relates to the soil, it obviously relates to the weather and uh, sort of the style and the conditions that the farmer's working within. So let's move across the lane here. So after we've got dry hay, and I should say that determining dry in a hay is a very challenging thing when you're first learning it. Um, you would think just by grabbing the hay, and typically you're, when you got a windrow, you're grabbing underneath if you feel any moisture between the hay and the ground, uh, you got the very least flip it. And uh, sometimes, like again, if you wait till the day you're going to bale it, you can flip it once after the top dew dries off. Flip it once, get it aerated, get it fluffy, get that heat and air coming in, and finish drying it for that day. Um, so this is a hay rake. This is this is late 60s, early 70s, vintage John Deere hay rake. Um, again, we're a nonprofit. We get a lot of donations here, so we don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Um, it's a very useful tool. It worked then, so it works now. So it's a very slow process, or can be, especially with older equipment, uh, because it's very easy to, uh, uh, to actually get up too much hay and actually stall the rake it's a ground driven rake. And so if you get it too loaded up, the wheels will freeze and lock up on you and you're no longer raking, and you're just dragging, which creates a big mess when you're trying to dry hay. Um, so the best thing you can do is sort of back out of that, get the hay lifted and start over. You're not gonna, you're not gonna solve that problem. You gotta physically get off the tra tractor and start spreading by hand um, the mess you made and then potentially re-rake it later. Um, we've got this one set up a little more helpful is that we actually put the, uh, the tongue of the rake on a draw bar uh, that we can lift uh, when we get into those situations and actually get out of trouble pretty quickly with it. So, um, so another test when you're checking for drying on hay is that once you get your hand underneath to see the moisture when you're ready to bale it is you again you're, you're feeling for moisture but there's I can't tell you how many times I have went to bale hay and it feels dry to touch and keep in mind you're typically in the middle of the afternoon or later part of the day uh, it feels dry to touch but until you physically manipulate it where you can actually crimp it multiple times by rotating a handful in your hand um, and see how it crimps and how it feels on the inside of those grass and legume fibers 
uh, do you get a true sense that the, uh, the bale is not dry or dry. And the final test, before you continue on, you can actually get as far as baling the hay and you actually make sure you get your tension right because the tension on the bale can actually sort of shift your attitude about whether um, it's dry or not. But go ahead and make a couple bales and if you grab that bale, because in the process of baling, and then we'll talk about the baler in a minute, it compresses the hay, so it's compressing the moisture also. So you can actually stick your hand in a compressed bale and feel moisture, and sometimes it's wet enough, you actually start to feel the heat from the moisture. And the other final test is once you've got one bale made and you go to pick it up, and you're typically baling, say, a 50, 60 pound bale, and you go to pick it up and all of a sudden it's an 80 pound bale, chances are it's too wet. So never push wet hay into the loft. You're better off to just take your chances and hopefully get it to dry out some more uh, before you continue to get up in the loft. And we'll talk about a lot of the downsides of putting up wet hay. There's a lot of them, some serious ones too. So let's check out the baler. All right, so here we are in front of my, my baler. And uh, this has been a very uh, good baler for me. I forget the model number, it's a uh, 336. And uh, I've been through a lot of balers, and this has been the most consistently uh, productive baler I've had. Um, and generally, productivity of a baler, in my opinion, centers around the knotter. The knotter is the most important to me in a baling, baling system and a baler. Um, the knotter sits under here. It's a very uh, complicated, it's, like a, it's built like a Swiss watch, you know, a lot of moving parts. And uh, the knotter actually takes the string, grabs it. Um, it's a little cog that spins it, has the needle that's coming underneath, holding the string, comes through the bale, um, and, it, uh, and it ties a knot. And so it's, uh, it's just a very important part. I, I, I can't tell you how many days I have spent uh, half the time bailing fixing a knotter. And this one will give up a knot every, I don't know, four or 500 bales. And I'm typically once a day having to fix the knotter. And it's generally during the transition um, between the bales of twine, the, the twine holder actually holds two bales per knotter side. And so there's always that special knot and a transition between the bales. Sometimes if you don't do a nice tight square knot, um, it'll hang up in the process. But if you got everything set right, positioned right, set up the knotter and the, and the bale or bales of twine, things should go well. So generally, um, there's a rake just like we saw in the hay bind in the front that's picking up the windrow. Uh, it's rotating it in. It's pushing it into the throat of the baler um, with a auger that spins on the top over above the rake. And it's pushing it into this chamber. This is the bale chamber. And this is the flywheel that sort of drives the, uh, the hammer. Um, and, it's, and it basically comes back and forth. Boom, boom, boom. And it's pushing that hay, hay tighter and tighter, which is as we'll see when we go up to the loft, it's creating leaves or sections of hay. And uh, generally, you don't want to run a baler faster than, uh, I'd say top end around 80 um, strokes a minute. You can actually hear it in the tractor um, if it's going faster than that, you really need to back off it because you're just beating your baler up. Some balers actually move slower than that. And of course, round balers is a whole, whole different mechanism. But, um, so it's shoving it to the back here and it's elongating a long piece of compressed hay towards the back. And um, this little star wheel right here controls and this control right here the length of the bale. So as this as this star wheel spinning around it's it's making this bar rise and uh, you can set how far it rises and that gives you the length of the bale. 
And once it gets to the, all the way to the end at the length of the bell, it triggers the knotter. The needles come through, rethreads the next bale, and, uh, and it starts the process over and over again. So when that, when that happens at the same time, um, the, uh, every th stroke, I should say, is sort of like trimming the ends or the sides of the bale. So, um, so it's a very nice process. So on this end, you could control how tight the bale is through this bar right here. And this has this long beam that creates pressure down on the top of the bale. Um, I always encourage people when they're first learning how to bale, only make a couple true bales. I, I say true bales because what's in here is left from the last cutting. And I leave it in there to sort of help maintain the settings that I had established in the last cutting. Now keep in mind, every different type of hay you cut has a different compression ratio. You know, it's, it's uh, straw, or this is, this is actually uh, what we call spelt hay. Uh, we talked about that earlier. We're cutting it at the sort of slightly less than dough stage. Um, it, it compresses much larger than if you're just doing a pure grass. So if I was switching over to pure grass or clover, which I will be in the next cutting, um, I'll be sucking these down together. You always sort of do these in unison. So after you make a few what I call true bales, you're past the old hay, which means you're going to make at least three, four more bales um, before you get to your true bales of that day. Um, uh, you're going to want to get off the tractor and, of course, turn the PTO off. Don't be dangerous. And you're going to pick up that bale. And it's going to be either balance, both strings are going to be at the same tension, and if they're not, you're going to adjust these, I generally at a turn at a time, um, up to three or four turns if it's really off kilter in terms of how tight that string is, and then the overall tension of the bale. You want that bale tight, because keep in mind, you're going to be stacking it pretty high, and uh, so you want to build building blocks that are pretty solid and hold together. So. Sometimes you have to get off the tractor three or four times after producing some more bales after you have adjusted it and, uh, and, and get it right. It's, it's worth every effort to get off the tractor and adjust the bale length, the weight, and tension, everything all at once. So it's, it's actually to me a very fun and exciting part because especially if you're, you're baling to the ground, when you, when you pull out of that field and you see three, four hundred bales sitting there on the ground, it's a beautiful sight. It makes you want to just take a picture right then and there. Um, a lot of people who make hay, they put attachments or extensions on it, so they're bailing straight up onto a wagon. That's a great strategy if you only have one other person working with you that day. You got the guy in the tractor and you got the guy on the wagon, and the tractor is feeding the bales to him and he's stacking. Now, that's a hard day for him or her. And uh, so, ideally, you put two on a wagon. Um, here at Stratford, we're very blessed with volunteers, so it actually goes quicker if I put all the bales on the ground. I have 10, 12 guys and gals show up um, to um, pick it up all at once, get it up the hill and into the barn and uh, ready for the next round. So, and then there you can go as far as actually what they call bell kickers, you know, or a contraption actually sends your bale into the air through a caged wagon um, the hard side to that is that it's not stacking them, it's putting in them wherever they land. And then you got to sort of unwedge them and get them out of that wagon through a single opening up at the front of the wagon. Um, that's, that allows a farmer to bail all by himself. But to clean out that mess out of a, a bale catcher, um, it's not fun. I can tell you that, especially in a hot day. All right, so let's, uh, let's go look at the finished product and talk about different types of quality of hay. Okay, so here we are up in the hay loft. Uh, we apologize for a little bit of background noise. We're actually moving uh, compost. Uh, when we muck the barn, we, uh, when we're wet out there, we just make big piles and let it cook down half, and then we actually uh, take it out later and have to move less because we let nature do its job. So I'm sitting here with two different types of hay that we've got in the barn. Um, we're up about 1,100 bales already this year. This, 
The season's setting up right. If I could get those fields I started showing you out there um, put up here in the next week or so, which so far not looking good, but we'll get there. Uh, we got at least one more solid good cutting left, and uh, we've got some areas that we may actually get a third cutting off of. Um, again, timing and Mother Nature rules it all. So, this is the spelt hay I was talking about. Um, it actually, um, I'll come a little closer to you. You can actually see the seed head starting to develop, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's like candy to the livestock. And they just don't eat go for the seed heads. They actually, in the dead of winter in particular, they'll eat this stuff that looks like straw. And uh, there won't be a drop left when they're done. So um, this is what I call a leaf or section of hay. Uh, this is where the, the plunger and the door continues to chop the hay as it pushes it through and sort of reorients it to, to build your bale as it's it's uh, moving through the chamber and uh, it's a beautiful hay. It's got a little bit of color in it, uh, very nutritious, uh, very well balanced. I, I could do a total diet on this, um, but I, I don't. I, I, I don't like eating the same thing every day, so uh, they don't either. So, so great hay and we actually, uh, we used to grow spelt for grain also. Uh, we recently got rid of our combine. I spent more time under it than, than on it. Uh, so we're making our, our mix still with spelt, but we're including the hay with it. And uh, it just takes more of it. So we have segregated this up here. So we always have some to make feed for the hogs and chickens. Um, but it'll also get heavily used this winter in particular. All right, so this is a grass hay. It's got a little bit of clover in it. It's almost predominantly grass. It's got some, uh, some orchard and uh, a little bit of Timothy. And it's got a little bit of red, a little bit of white, but I would say it's, it's, it's like 80, 85% grass. Now this is actually not our hay. It's, it was donated to us uh, by a neighbor. He called me up this winter and says, I'm gonna have hay this year that I can't make. So if you come over here and make it, you can have it. So that was a great donation. Uh, so thank you for that. So this feeds out very differently. And it feeds out differently depending on the time of year. Now if you look at this compared to what the livestock are eating right now, which is a moist hay or moist grass, this is completely dry. It's a bit like eating uh, a broom, you know. And um, so this time of year it's not the most palatable thing. But here's the thing about hay. Um, in feeding animals is that the small ruminants need that dry matter through their rumen uh, to keep them healthy. Um, it, it, it sort of keeps things solid, it adds roughage, um, and it, um, it actually helps to move parasites that they're inevitably, inevitably going to encounter. Uh, uh, out to the pasture and then it becomes another management issue or since if we're infecting the pastures with parasites that's why I have this rotation of at least 45 days between paddocks as we're grazing them. So um, if we have about 20 ewes right now. We good? And uh, we have um, about a dozen goats and um, so on a daily basis we're feeding at least one bale per chores of dry hay to these animals. So over 365 days, I mean, we got, we've got uh, that alone, you know, 700 bales that we're consuming just to maintain the small livestock through the entire season. So stacking hay, uh, if we come over here, this, this is what we had in that cutting. Um, typically, you're gonna be stacking with the bale on the bottom layer um, on its edge. You can see the difference here. You can see that baling twine strings here versus flat, the rest of the layer is up. And typically, I like to put the cut edge down. Now, there's again, there's different philosophies. I like the cut edge down, because think about it. Even though we're putting this up dry, it has the potential to accumulate additional moisture 
and uh, which migrates towards the bottom of the pile. So that moisture, if you laid these flat, would actually rot these strings out and those bales, you'll have to move them by section instead of entire bales. But more importantly, um, that moisture has nowhere to go. So if you put it on the cut edge, which this is, this is a cut edge here, you can actually see the cutting that's happening in each of those layers. It's like, it's like beard stubble. Where this is an uncut edge, it's very loose. And actually, if you looked at the whole leaf, it's a lot of our bend over. So the cut edge is what allows the moisture to escape. So as gravity moves the moisture to the bottom of the bottom layer, that cut edge allows that moisture to escape. Now, if I bring up a wet bale and I want it to dry out, and it's a single layer, what I'll do, uh, instead of putting it in the pile, and I'll talk to why we don't want to put it in the pile, um, I set the cut edge up then, and sometimes we'll set some fans up here, and then it evaporates through capillary action to help dry that bale out. Typically, if a bale's too wet, I'm never putting it in the stack because ultimately it could rot or start to mold. And uh, so I'm typically feeding wet bales out in that daily ration I was talking about, one bale per chore. So why don't I want to put up wet bales? Well, most obvious to everyone is the mold. Animals don't like mold. They'll turn their nose to it, and it's not good for them. It actually builds up in their system, and it just sort of creates a, a, a malaise in their, their psychology and in their digestive system. So I try to avoid mold, and I won't say that I've never fed moldy hay. You know, farmer's got to do what he's got to do. A good test for mold on a bale is to grab a full bale. If you're not sure about how moldy it is, is just drop it. And it's like a puff ball. If it's full of mold, it, it'll puff the mold as you drop it to the floor. So those kind of bells I shove to the back and I say for emergency or possibly use it for mulch, you know, in the garden. Um, the one that I actually have nightmares about, why we don't put up wet hay, is that the moisture, if you leave enough moisture in, in an anaerobic environment, which in that pile is, there are bacteria that will take advantage of that moisture and start to consume the protein in the hay and generate enough heat that between the tinder next to it of a dry bale and the heat that's generated in the wet bale, it spontaneously ignites. It will actually start a fire. It'll start off as a smolder and you'll smell it. If you come up into the barn, you can actually smell that smolder. And if you smell that, you're literally tearing these mountains of hay down to find where that hot spot is. And if it was left unattended, in addition to it continuing to spoil and smolder and ruin more and more hay, it'll eventually start. And like I said, it's my worst nightmare is to lose this beautiful barn. Uh, fortunately for the animals, they have access to the outdoors. Hopefully they're smart enough to know when to leave. But um, it's just a major tragedy. So, haymaking, it's a, uh, a wonderful process. It's a great community builder, it's a great family builder, great team builder, it's a great physical activity. It's some of the best times I've had in my life in uh, farming, is the whole process of making hay. Um, if you ever get a chance, you see a neighbor, a farmer, or you know, not need a hand, go out and toss a few bales and get a sense of what it's like. But I'll warn you, Hay days are usually the hottest day of the year. And you better be well hydrated and be willing to sit down if you get a little woozy because it is hard work. But I'll tell you what, when you're done with some hay, it's very rewarding. So hopefully you learned something from this and uh, we'll see you next week on uh, agroforestry, I guess. So uh, have a great one. Bye. All right, everyone. So that was our um, kind of, you know, talk about hay. So now we'll kind of go into some questions that um, like I have and want to talk about just to add to that a little bit. Um, if you didn't see my message in the live chat, um, feel free to ask questions. We welcome it. Um, so if you have any questions about hay, 
you know, feel free to drop those there. So to get started, I started the, you know, live stream with kind of what's your favorite part? What was your first experience? What's probably your, you know, least favorite part about hay? <laughs> well, I do have allergies, you know, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. It's, you know, I've had them my whole life, you know, and I, my, my first job in high school was mowing grass and uh, I just, Somebody told me at a young age, says, well, if you just keep exposing yourself to things that give you allergies, mm -hmm. then you get over them. I, I think there's some truth to that. <laughs> so, yeah, that's probably the hardest part. Timothy is my worst. Okay, yeah. I, I mean, I literally go into hives. And, <laughs> but uh, just make sure I take my Zyrtec down. Sure. So, but it's all, it's very true that uh, the best hay days are the hottest days of the year. Yeah. So it's, um, you got to like the heat some level right and that's uh, it's helpful to have a pond nearby yeah you know? <laughs> yeah so yeah but it's it, that you know when you, again when you look back even after suffering through an allergy or you know heat it's uh, you can see what you accomplished right and it's a wonderful feeling yeah so, for sure especially when you do it in the context of a team yeah um so the next question is a little bit more intense um so i want to ask about how you know, we will continue to adapt to, um, you know, changing weather from climate change and kind of like, do you have like a plan? I know it's hard to plan just with like, you know, radical weather, but kind of what do you anticipate being what we'll experience when it comes to hay in, you know, the next 10 years? Well, the, the region we live in, the temperate zone is becoming the new subtropics, right. uh, both in temperature and moisture. And, uh, the patterns are changing. We seem to get stuck in these long dry periods and long wet periods. Mm -hmm. So um, the problem with the long, long dry periods is hay is not growing. Right. And so you have to be able to catch it early. And you also have to be able to catch it late. Because the drought usually happens somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. you know, we've typically had at least two, three weeks extended in mm -hmm. the drought. So, um, so like I said earlier in the video, I've sort of given up the idea of looking for ideal cutting times because if you if you're always focused on that, you'll never cut it. Yeah. Um, you got to cut it while you can, and anytime you see it, even a three-day window, which is sort of we're getting like two two and a half-day windows right now. Yeah. Even a three-day window, if the conditions are right, you go for it. Um, and hope for maybe a three and a half day. So. What's becoming very popular, and I sort of see myself moving more and more towards, is and it's a very expensive venture. It doesn't have to be the way to bootstrap it. Bootstrap it is to get into what they call wet hay, okay, or haylage. Yeah. Basically, fermenting grass while it's wet. Mm -hmm. uh, the process is you're typically uh, cutting one day, raking the next, and baling. Yeah. Uh, with a lot of moisture in the hay. The moisture has to be at a certain level mm -hmm. uh, for it to ferment, ferment properly. Yeah. And, um, and then you totally wrap it, seal, seal it tight. Okay. Um, you, can, you can wrap anything from a small square bale to a, a larger squares to round bales. And then they actually have a system now where you get these long, uh, we call them uh, caterpillars or, yeah. or marshmallow, you know, caterpillars, you yeah. know. Um, where you're sort of picking out <clears throat> the round bales, but they're all wrapped together as one unit. And you open the end uh, every so often when you need it. And yeah. you pluck one out, and then you reseal it. Mm -hmm. and you lose some. That's the thing about all silage, haylage, mm -hmm. anything you ferment, including sauerkraut. Right. You lose the layer that's in touch with the air. Yeah. Um, but uh, that, that actually, that spoiled layer actually helps reseal it and protect it uh, into an anaerobic environment. Hmm. So. I have always seen those mm -hmm. and never really understood what was going on there. So that's kind of like interesting. Yeah, I mean, the silo is a wonderful thing. The system I would love to have is one that a, a, avoids the plastic altogether. Right. I always found the plastic to be very annoying. Yeah. Even the, the nylon or the, the, the twine wraps around the large round bales mm -hmm. um, is annoying. So there are systems where you could take a, uh, what was built as a corn silo, right? Um, and you blow your wet grass into the top of the silo, mm -hmm. and um, after the first few layers, you create enough of an anaerobic environment um, 
that um, it starts to ferment. Yeah. And you can keep adding to it. And uh, silo management's a whole another beast. Yeah. Something I have to learn more about. Yeah. But uh, ideally, you would fill a silo uh, in a single event, mm -hmm. so you're not doing it layers because you'll always have some spoilage in between. Right. You know, the time to make it. Yeah. So. I, I have seen it in like a silo, so mm -hmm. I think that's kind of where I had that idea, but I didn't realize that the ones on the ground was that was what was going on. The same on. process, yeah. yeah. A, a very cheap way to do that also is to uh, actually pull, put, blow it into pits and then cover it with hmm. uh, an airtight uh, tarp or uh, plastic again. Yeah. Um, it's very common in dairy farms to see silage being made, but that's usually not uh, haylage, it's usually corn silage. Hmm. And, yeah. Uh, which is blown. Uh, you can actually blow uh, corn silage into a tube, mm -hmm. a plastic tube. Yeah. Uh, you, you can do the same with, with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the equipment can be expensive. Sure. Uh, so it's some knowledge and setup time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have about seven minutes left and we don't have any questions. Um, but I wanted to ask also kind of like some you know, things that you wish you had known, you know, as you were getting into bailing hay, you know, if there's anything that kind of, you always have like those aha moments, what kind of has stuck out to you over the years from when you first bailed hay to, to now? Well, I wish I had appreciated more about the quality of the forage you're starting with. Um, uh, it, it, a good quality forage, you know, that's been vetted well and, and tried and true for your region very big about picking regional the uh, developed uh, forages um, makes a huge difference in how it cuts how it makes and how it stores and ultimately how it feeds sure. um, it's easy to take uh, sort of older information and apply it to, to the current time the problem with a lot of the new forages though is, uh, again, is they're very expensive not that they're not worth that cost mm -hmm. But you have to be in a very serious economy of scale uh, operation. You talk, I'm talking on a head of cattle mm -hmm. before you can actually justify the cost of going into a higher cost of seed mm -hmm. to produce forage. So, um, so I wish I had that appreciation. And then the whole process of making hay, I wish someone had told me that hay can feel dry when it's on the ground, but when you pack it, yeah. It won't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you got to sort of be intuitive beyond what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's the second or third test where you're always getting off the tractor. Yeah. And uh, grabbing that bale after it's been bailed. Yeah. And realizing, ah, there's still a lot of moisture <laughs> in there. Yeah. So nothing worse than having a bunch of guys standing around like, ready to go after it. Yeah. And you make your first bale and it says, eh, this ain't going to work today, guys. Sorry. Right. It's, uh, it's all head to the park. You know? <laughs> yeah. So. so, yeah, there's a lot of little things. That's that's life. Sure. And that's farming. Yeah. And it's a constant, uh, I had a couple and back one. And learn. Right. Learn. Yeah. Um, to kind of wrap things up, I wanted to ask, do you think the animals have a favorite hay? Mm -hmm. You know, like, what do they like to eat the most? Um, Timothy feeds out very well. Um. Of course, they, they love all the legumes, and anytime you throw a legume out, um, I mean, alfalfa is a bit rich for them, so they, they snarf it um, when, they, when they sense it. Mm -hmm. um, I have, I've taken uh, spoiled livestock to another level by starting to cut uh, hay with grain in it, or grain at dough stage, mm -hmm. basically. So uh, they also see, um, the spelled hay we do now, um, rye hay with some grain seed in it, and then the uh, the oat hay. That's that's a real popular one. Too. Yeah. yeah. What's, what's great about oats is the soluble fiber. Mm -hmm. and it makes everybody feel good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Including me. So. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's uh, it's easy to spoil livestock. Yeah. So. I'm sure they're happy. I for try it. not to. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, if there's not any questions, we'll go ahead and wrap it up for the day. Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, we have two more segments left. Next week will be Introduction to Agroforestry. Um, we've 
We've got a couple things in the works, so you'll have to tune in and watch to see what we're going to have for you. Um, it's an exciting topic, and I know it's a big investment is agroforestry. You know, it's it's a lifelong investment into um, you know the land, and so it's definitely something really valuable to learn about. And it can be something that's easy to do when you you know first buy a piece of land, you know, plant trees, and you know, kind of have that idea in mind. Um, and then the following week will be our wrap up. We'll have a nice little um, kind of summary of everything that we've gone through. If you're someone that has a hard time tuning in for a whole hour, maybe you'll be able to pick something away from, you know, just a couple different things um, as we kind of summarize every week. Um, so again, you know, like and subscribe to the channel. If you haven't yet, um, in our description below, we have a link to uh, Stratford Ecological Center's website for more information. And then we also have a link to donate if you're interested in donating to, you know, continue supporting the Beginner Farmers Growing Collaborative. Um, so thank you again for tuning in this week, and I hope to See you all tuned in next week.